Our scripture comes from the second book of Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. I don't know about you, but I find myself more and more thinking about the future and heaven, what it might be like to be living there. I think one of the things I'd like to do in my spare time is to meet Timothy and ask him, how was it to be with that giant Paul and learn from him? How was it to be mentored? What was it like? Can you imagine? Wouldn't that be interesting to be able to learn? Because I know, I'm sure Paul enjoyed having the younger people that were dedicated and faithful that he could influence and help them in their ministry. And in writing to Timothy, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, a very sobering and short text, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So it's not a very happy text in a sense, but it's reality. When I think about how many people throughout history have suffered and given their lives for the name of Jesus, it's staggering. So why should we all be exempted? Why is it that we would expect that we may not face some challenges? God wants us to know that it, just because we face even the worst of challenges, he is there for us. He's preparing for us. And this little bit of roughness on this planet Earth is being replaced with an eternal future without end, if we'll just be faithful. May God bless us as we think of those things. 48 years ago, 1975, I went on a Maranatha project uh, in Mexico, and I took my whole construction crew. I had a business in Columbus, Ohio that was thriving. I owned a home. Uh, I taught church and Sabbath school up in Cleveland, Ohio, because I'd go up there to get my laundry washed and, and a good meal of food with the mom and dad. And uh, so my life was just in a regimen, humdrum, and sometimes my brother was a skydiving instructor. And so he finally begged me in to go skydiving. And so I got 20 jumps in before I lost my arm. And he says, hey, I'll dump you out of a plane with one arm if you want. Uh, nope, nope. The Lord has been kind to you, to me, Don. So we're not going to go that route at all. Uh, there are better thrills to be had. And I'm going to tell you about them this morning. So in 1975, I went on the Maranatha trip uh, to Mexico. And the guy in charge down there told me, Don, we, don't, we need help down in Elkins, West Virginia. They're building a youth camp there at Linda Vista. Could your crew come down and help us build? Because your crew doesn't have gray hair, and you could do some of the stuff the rest of us can't do. So uh, I went down there, and on Friday night, Friday afternoon, I took my tool trailer down there. I got within 20 miles of the camp, and one of those crooked... West Virginia home, uh, West Virginia roads, almost heaven, was almost heaven for me. I didn't have my, I didn't have my seat belt on, and uh, uh, I, the trailer, I lost control of a heavy triaxle trailer full of tools and supplies, and uh, uh, anyway, I went off the road, rolled over, and you know, children, when you're wearing a seat belt, that keeps you inside this protective cage. But when your seatbelt's not on and you're rolling upside down, you're like in your mother's washing machine going up and down, bouncing around, and the windows just disappear, the front window, the side windows. So when everything came to rest, Don Reed was with his feet still inside the passenger window. The truck was on its edge down in this ditch full of water. And his feet were in the window, and he was kind of bobbing on the water. And if the truck would have just rolled over like that one more time, the roof would have been on top of him. It would have been flowers for me. But the Lord had a plan. He knew what it was. I didn't know what it was. But I had gone at his will and his providence to go on a Maranatha trip, and he blessed me. You know, you just don't understand where the path the Lord's taken you. Why on earth all this struggle? Um, so 10 days, in the ten, 10 days in a coma and um, uh, 20 days in the hospital, and I went home, and I, Dad helped me take my first shower. I stepped out of the shower, and there was a full-length mirror, and I looked in that mirror 
face on for the first time in my life. And this was a nightmare I couldn't believe. Lord, this can't be true. It's true. So um, life went on. God blessed me. Uh, I went back to Andrews and I got a degree in construction. And uh, that was a long story. I won't even get to that because I have a much more important story to tell you. I lived all over the United States doing various construction sites. And I, this place over here in uh, this area is just so beautiful. You have a very, looks, it looks like Rocky Mountains in miniature. Uh, it looks like uh, southern Ohio, at Indi southern Indiana. It's just Beautiful. I love this area over here, and it's green. Now, I live up by Cumberland Gap, which is just a little bit north and east of Knoxville. It's right on the border with Kentucky. In fact, eight miles into Kentucky, into, the, into Tennessee is where I live. And if I go on up north eight miles, I come to the point of where Virginia comes along and stops. That's where... Daniel, uh, Davy Crockett brought his, uh, was a leader to bring those immigrants coming from Europe, coming across the ocean. They had to get across the Allegheny Mountains, and so and within 250 miles each direction is this pass right there, Cumberland Gap. That's where I live. March 2nd last year, Mr. Trump made an announcement. He said, the primaries are going on, and I am going to go every uh, three times a month, and uh, I'm going to promote a different candidate. And so that's what he did. Uh, on March 4th, I received a phone call from the same man who was in prison in Egypt and went on the railroad across Russia that has seven different time zones, 5,800 miles long. He was on the phone. He said, Don, he says, Mr. Trump's made this announcement. We're building a team. Would you like to join our team? We want to give away great controversies. We have a donor that will give, supply all the books that we need for these rallies. I said, well, it's a no-brainer, Lou. I want to go. Let's, when do we start? He says, well, Don, he says, the first rally is going to be in Florence on March 12, and I don't know anybody down in Florence, South Carolina. So I said, well, I'll get on the, uh, I'll take care of that. I'll see what I can do. So, of course, I get on Google, and I find the local church, and the church phone rings and rings, and, and then there's an answering machine, and, and I, I'm not making any headway at all. And then I remembered my cousin used to live down in Florence. So I called her up. She says, I know the pastor, all this stuff. So as it ended up, we ended up our team of seven people going down there. We had this church service in Florence, South Carolina on March 12 and Sabbath morning. And then Sabbath afternoon, we went over to the rally. Now we had prepared earlier and we had our stuff all in place. It was out at a regional airport. It was cold, it was windy, and it had rained all morning. So it was miserable. The people attending that rally uh, were really struggling because when you go to a Trump rally, uh, you have to go through airport type security. And they go the wand over you, they dump out the ladies' purses on a table, they sort through what they want, and then they get dump it all back in there, and, and you can't take in a bottle of water, a pocket knife, an umbrella, or a book. So. We were stuck with giving out the books, and it was perfect. The Lord worked in this thing. Give out the books as people are coming out. So as people are coming out, we just have our volunteers right somewhere close to the exit point. Sometimes if it's a large building, there'll be multiple doors, so we need lots of volunteers, like up in Casper, Wyoming. Or maybe it will be down there like in Florence, where it was just in one security point the people were coming out or in Columbus, Ohio at the fairgrounds where Adriana was giving them out right behind the concrete barriers. She was stepping out, stepping out. But we were giving out the books there in uh, Florence. And I'll tell you a little story uh, starting at this point. We make application to be part of 
that, that with it, we get permission from the Trump organization to be there. We are considered part of the vendors that are selling hats and T-shirts and all of that stuff, uh, hot dogs, whatever it may be. But we're not inside the rally. We can't go in there unless we go through security. We don't want to go in there. We don't have any business, particularly if it's Sabbath. We don't want to go in there. We can hear some of the noise going on. We never see Mr. Trump because he's hidden in behind great big jumbotron screens are up in the air and all of that stuff. And so um, we're outside getting ready to give out the books. We put our books in just in the right position. And... I get acquainted with the vendors that are there. And there'll be these big buses. You've seen some of them that have all over them all this, graf this graffiti type artwork that says Trump or it says whatever political candidate it might be. And there's all this fancy artwork on them. Great big pro prevost, provost buses, whatever they call them, giant things. And then they deck them out with flags and all that stuff. So I get to know those people because we have to find out how are we going to put our little trailer with our books in it or, and our, our cars or whatever we got, our volunteers. And so we work together. All of the vendors work together and we get it all lined up and say, hey, you know, Joe, is it all right if I put underneath your table, it's got all of these ribbons and stuff on it. Could we, hats, can we, can we put a few boxes on it? Oh yeah, Don, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. God used my curse as a tattoo Everybody knows who Don Reed is at a Tump rally. Every one of the snipers up on the roof know who Don Reed is because they watch him go around. They can identify him. So God uses these things for a benefit. So one of the vendors came to me during the, uh, as, as things was going on, almost uh, ready for the time for the Trump to be over with, uh, he said to me, Don, he says, give me some books and I'll put them out here on my table. And he also had a PA system on his bus and he's broadcasting the Trump uh, uh, program, okay? And we heard Trump say goodnight, folks, and we knew the crowd was going to cart coming out at us. So uh, Rocky let us uh, hit, use his tables to put these books out there. And then Rocky got on his PA and he started saying, free books, folks, free books. I got a free book here. <laughs> and wasn't it fantastic what the Lord, the Holy Spirit can do? Unbelievable. Total stranger, total stranger. He had never read the book. In fact, a couple of rallies later, he said to me, Don, what's in that book? <laughs> I kid you not. I'm not making that up. That's what he said to me. Well, there was more people there. There was... Um, um, See, uh, Rocky and let's see, I'm, <laughs> I'm dumping some names here. Um, it doesn't make a difference. This, uh, this fella, um, I've got to get his name. Oh, uh, Danny Hamilton. Danny Hamilton was from Atlanta. Danny Hamilton owns a bus company. He does charter service. And he takes rock groups and these people that are advertising for gun rights and all that stuff in tours all across the United States. He has 50 of those buses. And so he, uh, one day, uh, we had given him numerous books along the way. And uh, I say to him, have you read the book? No, I haven't read the book yet, but it looks like a good book. And then uh, one day he said to me, Don, he says, could I, have, uh, could I have a case of books? He says, I have a restaurant in Atlanta too. And I'd like to give those books out at my restaurant. Can you believe that? That book is powerful. When you put this book in your hands, you become an invincible force for good. Do you want to be an invincible force for good? Do you want to see the Lord come back soon? Do you want him to come back tomorrow or the next day or the month later after you've died? No, we want to end this thing. The Lord's given us the tools to work with. So anyway, Danny said to me, I've got a restaurant and I'll give away those books. And uh, so uh, I gave him some cases of books. And then in Casper, Wyoming, uh, way out there, uh, we, f we flew in and I get out there and I tried to get uh, our books, our U-Haul van. You know, the books come from Remnant Publications up in Coldwater, Michigan, and they get freight delivered by common carrier 
to the different locations to a freight terminal. From the freight terminal, then, the volunteers, the organizers, have to get the books to the rally site. So we have usually a U-Haul van, a little, little tiny U-Haul van, and we load them up and we take them out to the site. And our U-Haul van then becomes a little castle in the middle of all these different vendors because it has a very precious cargo. Danny said to me in Casper, Wyoming, while Trump is up speaking, and it's a lull out there, he said to me, Don, he says, before, before I leave, can I have a number of cases? I'm out of books at my restaurant. I said, Danny, let's get them right now. So I got him, I think it was five cases of books. Uh, that's 600 books, 600 books. 600 little messengers for the Lord went out of his restaurant in Atlanta. And I said to him, I want your address. So he gave me his address. I went down to see firsthand myself if this was really true, what's going on. It was. Every word was true. In fact, he said to me, look, I've got a bus over here. You guys ought to buy. I've got an extra bus. I'd, I'd sell you a bus. So, folk, if, if we want to do this thing right, we can have a bus. He will sell us a bus. That's <laughs> anyway. So Danny Hamilton, one of the vendors there, without even knowing what the book hardly, he hard, you know, he'd read the introduction and some of the uh, chapters, the, the titles. That's all they know. But that spirit works on, with that book. We did a rally, in fact, two rallies up in Detroit. And in Detroit, uh, we went to what was called Washington, uh, Michigan, which is just north of Detroit. And there was a big coliseum up there, a sports arena. And it was big enough they had like, uh, six uh, tennis courts indoor and a basketball court, all running simultaneously. Huge place. Trump took that hole over, all inside of that. And uh, of course, I've gone up early to scope out the place, and we found a place to for, be with our books outside. They had a big jumbotron, and of course, people have to line up in queue in these uh, the, in this gated line of traffic. So they're waiting to go through. Uh, thousands of people are waiting to go through the, se the security check. They line them all up in between through there. So the, all these gates are full of traffic, and they have a big jumbotron up there showing different people talking and so on. We're out there, and we're seeing all these people. And I'm saying, wow, Lord, this is fantastic. And we need to get some books moved over to here or some moves over to there. There was out in front of that place uh, was just one stretch of pavement. They were remodeling the whole area over there. And so we were able to get from all the other vendors, the Trump organization let us be right out front on the concrete instead of out in the mud, uh, which the place turns to a quagmire of mud when you get thousands of vehicles tramping through. We were there with our books on the pavement right at the exit where people came out. Fabulous location. You know who was there? Adventist Frontier Missions missionary Brian Wilson. I didn't know it was him. I had been, you know, I go through lots of volunteers. Some of the volunteers came from the Detroit church, and I don't know where all they come from, all over. Some of them drove from Andrews University some four hours away over to this place. It was a great group of people that came out. And so Brian Wilson's there. I didn't even know that until I was reading my Adventist Frontier Missions magazine. And Brian Wilson had an article up there about how he was blown away with giving away books at a Trump rally. There's more to the story because I told people, look, we're going to meet at the um, Detroit First Seventh-day Adventist Church, downtown Detroit. And we'll all join together. There'll be potluck if you want to have potluck. And so they had a potluck. And then I'll tell you, I don't know where I were going to be at the Trump rally to that time. So I'll tell you where to go when we get to the, uh, we'll have this pre-rally meeting in the church. I've since learned we dispense with all of that. And I'll tell you why here in just a moment. Because I waited for people to come in. Of course, people are dribbling in. 
And I send them out to the Trump rally. I tell them, you just go here, go here, go here, go here. And they go. And then I wait for more people to come in. The people from over at Berrien Spring come in. They're a little bit later. And I tell them where to go. And finally, when it's getting almost time for Trump to speak, I say, you know, I got to get out of here. So I leave with three carloads of people. Amongst them was Brian Wilson. So these people are following me. We have a little convoy, four vehicles. We come over, get within two miles of the four-lane highway exit for the Trump rally, and it's dead stopped. Dead stop. And we would wait, and then we'd move forward two car lengths, and then we would wait, and we moved car, and we went through that whole thing. Meanwhile, it got time for Trump rally. You know, it, it, it's, they were all waiting to go in to the rally. So we finally got up there to the point at which you turn off the road to go into the rally, and I said, okay, you, everybody get out of my car, just dump out, and you go in, and we'll get the cars parked somewhere over here. So all these volunteers go out, and they go over, and they meet the security people, the policemen that are directing traffic, and all the people start, the volunteers start coming back to me. What's wrong? Oh, they say the rally's closed. Too many people. What? We've come all this way, and the rally's closed? So um, uh, I thought, well, what can we do? Well, I had seen the area, and I thought, well, if we just drive on up the four-lane highway a little further, I'll stop along the side of the road, and I'll let the, the volunteers get out and go down through the ditch, through the marshland, and over to the rally. Great idea. So... That's what we did. And so the four drivers of the cars stayed up here, and I waited and I watched to see what was going to happen. So the volunteers started across and went down through the ditch, started through the marshes and so on. Well, there's a security perimeter around the uh, venue there, and a big black SUV comes along, and out gets a bunch of FBI. So uh, I decide I better get out at this point and get my people out of this mess. And so I, I go over, start headed through the, wading through the water and stuff. And, and I get over there and here's Brian Wilson. And he's just a glow. He says, it's okay, Don. He says, don't worry about a thing. He says, they said we can't come in now. But if we wait until Mr. Trump is into position, then we can come in. So we all loaded back up in the car and we went back and I parked at a car dealership over yonder way and we walked in and everything worked out just fine. We gave away, you will have at your, oh, you've got it there at your fingertips right there. I don't even have one up here. If you look underneath um, uh, the Washington, it's like number four or five up there, you'll see how many books we gave away, how many books we take, how many books uh, uh, we gave away. 4,000 some books, I don't remember how many there were. But it was a bunch of people. But that's what we do after every at every rally, is and then there's these miracle stories just like that that are happening all the time. The Lord gets us into the best positions to give away the books. We never know where they're going to be given away at. Um, we get a, a lot of spontaneous result uh, results uh, responses from the people as they're getting these books. I mean. When you've got a crowd of people coming through, they will break down the barriers and come on through anyway on their way home. And so we get wherever those holes are developing and we start giving away books. We try to put a couple beautiful ladies there and a man who has pre-cut open the boxes of cases of books, he reaches in, grabs books and hands it to this lady who's got them underneath her arm and with her free hand, I can't demonstrate this, but she's saying free book or souvenir, whatever it may be, and handed out eye to eye to each one of those people a book, a book, a most precious book. They don't even know how precious it is. And uh, uh, that's, that's just kind of the routine we go through uh, is just giving out the books one after the other. Um, uh, what else can I say? Oh, oh, uh, the the the, re the spontaneous responses are this. Uh, could I have more? I teach a Sunday school class, and this is about religious history. Have you ever tried giving a great controversy to a Sunday school teacher locally? Any successful people doing that? Huh? 
We do it all the time at a Trump rally. I can't help it. They're coming out of a Trump rally. Jesus gave, he, he, he went into all kinds of tax collectors' houses, <laughs> the most despised people. He went into adulterers' places. He had one lady even wash his feet with her hair. How horrible that was. Well, anyway, uh, could I get more for my Sunday school class? All right. Uh, I told this morning the story about I had to man a gate. There were only uh, t two people came from all of Wisconsin Conference. I contacted all the people, all the pastors, all the churches, multiple times, even on the day of the rally uh, to the last moment. And only two people came, and they drove for three hours from somewhere out in Worcester, northwestern Wisconsin. And anyway, so the seven, we had seven volunteers to man this great big group with 5,600 books to give away. But the Lord, he's in control of everything. I tell people, you know, the Lord will send just the right person and just the right quantity of people. So... I normally try to go around and make sure that everybody's efficiently giving away the books and if there's any problems, collecting the, uh, the, open, the empty cases and so on. But on this one, I had to man a gate, a, 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 an exit gate. And so the people were coming through, coming through, coming through, coming through. And I had, I think it was five or six cases of books right there to give away. And uh, of course, I'm having to work at one hand in and out. And then <laughs> it's kind of hysterical to watch a paper hanger. Anyway, uh, so I had this, I was watching as I was giving these books out. You don't have time, but you just free book, free book. And if you get eye contact, they'll take the thing and then they disappear. And then if you people turn and they don't want to look at you, you, you don't work with them. Well, there was this guy that came along. He glanced and then he just walked by like this. But I saw him. I saw him. He's walking along. And he's slowing down. And then he's kind of tottering a little bit. And then he spin on, spun on his heels and he came back over. And I'm seeing this out of the corner of my eye and I'm doing free book with this other person. And I see him, he comes over and he says, could I have a book? I have changed my mind. And I said, sure, sure. He said, but you know, I, I would like to give one to, I don't remember, his family member. He ended up with three books. I was more than glad to give me three books because that man had had the Holy Spirit work on him for at least 10 seconds, 15 seconds to spin him around. It happens all the time. Um, isn't it, you know, what other kind of evangelism could you have ever done going door to door and see the results like that? Well, of course you do. But it, at the end of the day, you've done two people of people. It's really fun. It's really, uh, really satisfying. Um, I see my friend Chuck is coming up this direction, so I need to come to conclusion here somewhere. I have some notes. Was wow. there something you want me to talk about? Yeah, I'm not going to let you finish if you don't tell us about this ministry here. Oh, you, yeah, okay. That, that's the other half of it, and we won't take the whole bunch of time, but tell us some of the, the stories you told. All right, all you right. You should have been at the first service. You would have heard more, but Don, how about, how'd you get a billboard ministry and, and some of these uh, different varieties you have here? <laughs> All right. Uh, if you go through the back back there today, over by the stand, I have a bunch of, in the lobby, uh, I have a number of these eight or 11 by 17 uh, laminated art pieces. Those are all billboards that we've had up. There are eight different kinds. They're on this postcard. There should be some postcards laying over there. I didn't bring enough. I don't know. I brought enough, but I don't know where they went to. Uh, so uh, when COVID struck back in February of 2020, you remember uh, February 21, John Bradshaw got on Zoom, and we had a Zoom church service in your front room of your house, and for... Um, how many weeks was that? I had it written down here. It's like 16 weeks, something like that. We didn't have church service. But you know, as we look back in retrospect, who's our great adversary? The devil. And he knows that he's coming up to the last moments of his history. And his, he's angry. And what is he going to try to do? He's going to stop what? Evangelism. He doesn't want any of 
his people to switch sides. So evangelism was put on hold. And this really bothered me, and it ached me when we did go back to church. You had to wear masks. You couldn't sing. You had to space out. You had all these signs over, warning, and all that kind of stuff. It was just, it was just so horrible. And so, uh, and it certainly wasn't conducive for evangelism. Invite your neighbors to come over to your church service and talk through a mask. Anyway, so this bothered me. And as I was driving down the road, I thought, what can I do? What could possibly be done to circumvent this? So then I saw a sign, a billboard. I don't know what it had on there, but it dawned on me. That billboard, COVID or not, is preaching. It's talking 24-7 without any censorship. We need to have a billboard. So about that time, in fact, it was April 1st, my father, 96 years old, Viet or a, 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 a Army veteran, uh, he passed away. And he left to each one of us kids, four of us, a little inheritance. And so at that very moment, I'm needing to start off this billboard evangelism. And I'm thinking, why should I spend my allotment? It was only $40,000, but, you know, I could maybe make a down payment on a half a pickup truck. I need a new truck. My truck's out there. You'll see it. It's kind of, it looks like it's got cancer on it, but it's, it's still working and it's paid for. It's paid for, young folk. Anyway, uh, so uh, I, I said, what can I, oh yeah, I'll use it for, this will be perfect. So I called up Julie Wilkerson, my Lamar billboard rep, who has become a wonderful friend of mine. You know, in the billboard industry, they have to advertise whatever pays, and it can be Chick-fil-A, it can be pilot gas stations, or it can be vodka, or some other kind of booze, whatever it may be, and their art department has to make up the art for that stuff. It has been a pleasure. I have the greatest reputation over at Lamar, Knoxville, because they get to put up billboards with a message. Now, my messages are not offensive to Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever it is, a Catholic. They're just Bible texts. You can't go wrong when you're putting up a Bible text, can you? God's word, right? So Julie said to me, uh, yeah, I can get you a place. And I said to her, Julie, I don't have a lot of money. I didn't tell her how much I had, but I said, it isn't going to last long. But I need to get a in a place that's got a lot of traffic. Now, the cost of the signs is based upon how much traffic flow, vehicles per day. And so you people here are know full well where Interstate 75 and 40 go through Knoxville. There's 15 miles of businesses through there, six lanes, eight lanes wide with lots of billboards. And I said to Julie, is any of those billboards available? She said, yeah, I have one that's available here in two weeks. I said, I'll take it. Now tell me where it's at. <laughs> it's right on the strip. It's right there where the Motel 6 sign is. Maybe you've seen it as you're where the big six is on Motel 6. It's on the south side of the, uh, of the road. Uh, and it's uh, the billboard is facing east. So as you're traveling west, like you're going home here uh, through Knoxville, you would see it up on the left. Anyway, uh, $2,700 every four weeks. That's the bargain because 100 and 195,000 vehicles a day go by. It may be buses full of people. It may be carloads of people. And while those people are going by there, they're seeing the sign about Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath, Saturday. Uh, Sabbathtruth.com. Hey, Johnny, look up. Well, what is that? What is that? And so right there in their car, they're looking up sabbatruth.com. And presto, what comes up to mind? Sabbatruth.com. Oh, yeah. And then uh, the, the, the people over there at Amazing Facts, which is sabbatruth.com, all, all these billboard ads are Amazing Facts web links. Amazing Facts folk have ingeniously designed it such when you go on web link, one web link, they're also advertising for spiritualism. State of the Dead, for 
uh, the judgment, uh, come out of Babylon, spiritualism, you know, all these different things from that one website. Wouldn't it be fabulous? Wouldn't it be fabulous for you at your church here in Dunlop to have a billboard somewhere in your community? You're not going to be paying $2,700. You know, when you divide that up, uh, Boy, see, four sevens is 28. Uh, that's $700 a week. That's $100, $100 a day. Would you pay $100 a day to reach 195,000 vehicles? When you figure it all up, when I've, I've been doing this now for three years, it costs 48 cents to do 100 vehicles a day. I, I mean, 100 vehicles to do, uh, excuse me, I, I'm saying that all wrong. 48 cents to reach 1,000 people, 1,000 vehicles, 1,000 vehicles, 48 cents, less than the cost of a postage stamp. So you could put on it anything you want. You can use my artwork. It's not patented. I have, and you will have to do also, uh, gotten the uh, royalty rights, copyrights with the different... Uh, uh, people that are doing the artwork, they have to make a living. And the Adventist, these are, this is all Adventist uh, artwork here. Good Salt's the name of the, the group. They've got all of the Pacific Press, Review and Herald, all of the children, the, the Bible story pictures, all of that stuff is on there. You can sort out whatever you want. So you'll see pieces of this one here with Jesus with the Ten Commandments. Uh, I don't know what you're showing them up there that says, uh, remember the Sabbath day. Jesus is pointing to the Ten Commandments. That was taken out of, Jesus is over here. The children of Israel have got a bunch of tents down in the valley. Jesus is pointing across those tents, across the valley, and there in the far corner was the Ten Commandments. So they're able to take and digitally tear these things apart over at Lamar. And Fernando, who's so happy, he's a Christian man too, he loves to do this work to put uh, God before people in a very beautiful way. Um, let's see, what else am I going to go to here? I'm, um, oh, uh, let's see. so we have taken and circumvented COVID. COVID just forced us into new avenues. I don't say that billboard evangelism is the final answer. God's going to work a miracle somehow. It could be through simple things as a sign. Mrs. White tells us we'll be amazed what simple means God uses to finish the work. And um, I, I hope that you can be a part of finishing the work. Um, where am I looking here? I, uh, I look, I'm sorting through my stuff here. All right, yesterday, up, uh, you all know where Lenore City is, up on your way to Knoxville. It's the last exit before you get to the junction of 40 and 75. Anyway, um, I've had over there a billboard up there that says, trust him. It shows Jesus in the, in the operating amphitheater helping out the surgeons. And it had got, I paid for a couple months for it to be on there. That was my contract. And then it got overgrown with weeds. And so the sign stayed up there. They quit charging me for it. Well, now it's gotten to be illegible. And so just last week, I said to myself, you know, Lord, I'm maxed out. I personally am underwriting. I have to guarantee, I keep saying I, forgive me, but Someone has to guarantee the contracts. I've never in the three years been late or defaulted on a payment. Some of the payments for four weeks has been seven and eight thousand dollars. Some of the weeks have only been three thousand dollars. Right now, I'm at my maximum, which is around thirty-five hundred dollars a month. I depend on people like you. I have Social Security, 
And those of you that are on Social Security that have gray hair, you know you don't get $3,000 a month. You know, you add it all up, you might get $1,500, whatever it is, and then you got to buy your gas, whatever it is. So God has blessed. I've dedicated, I've told him, I will give you everything I've got if you'll keep these boards up. And so donors have shown up. Uh, I gave this presentation. Oh, I, what happened was, uh, oh, well, let me finish up. Let me finish up here at uh, 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 Lenore City. So that sign got grown up with weeds. So I said last week, Julie, uh, I would like to see you clear out all that brush and I will buy that board again. You can give me a new contract and we'll put up a, a brand new, I'll buy a new brand new vinyl. So uh, she says, okay, I'll look into it. Then the next day, yesterday, she called me up or she sent me a text or an email. She sent me an email. I'm in the last generation <laughs> before technology took place. But uh, Julie said, Julie sent me an email and it showed a picture of a billboard. This is exactly what I get from her. And it has the specifications. It's um, weekly impressions, 183,499 vehicles uh, per week. Uh, it's 14 by 48 feet. Uh, it's illuminated at night, and I pay an extra hundred bucks so that at 11 o'clock they cut off the lights because they think the traffic flow's pretty much over. But what about the truckers? That's when the truckers come out of hibernation, and those poor guys, they're bored stiff. They need to see the truth, don't they? The word. So I buy all night illumination. Besides that, in the wintertime, it gets dark at six o'clock, and I want everybody to see my signs. I'm paying good money to see that nice sign up there. So anyway, that's the specification sheet. And then she mails me a contract. Chuck, you may want to, or you, you just may want to see how this is working, her church treasure. She sends me this contract and digitally uh it tells me uh you know how much it is my name and the location the size of it and what it's going to cost and the total cost i have a sign rented up there now right next to where this covered up sign is just south of the lenore city exit off of 75 as you're look going south on the left hand side all by itself now a sign Beautiful, standing up by itself, contracted from, let me get this straight to you, August 28 of 23 to August 25 of 24, a total cost of $12,090, divided up in 13 payments. You know, it's something your church could afford. I told this same, a, 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 la a, a lady from Cleveland, Ohio, she was an Adventist lady. She was going down to College Dale. There seems to be a lot of Adventists down that direction. By the way, I have a sign up down there at College Dale exit. As you're coming north at the 18.2 mile marker on 75, you've just left Chattanooga, and you see a billboard, or I see a sign up there that says, next three exits, uh, Cleveland, Cleveland. Next three exits, Cleveland. If you look just right behind that sign, over the side, is this sign right here. From March 5 of 23 to March 5 of 24, this sign will be up there. What better place should it be? What better message should the Adventists in that Adventist ghetto give than the Sabbath truth, right? I haven't had anybody volunteer to go. I haven't gone down there shopping for a, for, for volunteers to donate. But folks, that could be here at your place. That could be right here at your place. I'm at 1230. Uh, let me conclude by saying, God has been so, so good to me. It's not me, but it's the donors that have helped out. This lady that went and saw the sign down in Cleveland, Tennessee, going down to Chattanooga, uh, to S Southern College, she went back up to her church in Brooklyn, Ohio. They started a billboard ministry. They have as a line item in their church budget, billboard advertising. Every month, they are buying a sign up there on Interstate 70 or Interstate 80. Any of those areas down there, Lamar's everywhere, rotating around this beautiful message we have. 
I hope that you can be an evangelist for the Lord. Don't wait for somebody else to move. God will move wonderfully for you. You see miracles. It's so satisfying to see total strangers say, hey, I'll give away your books. And you'll hear total strangers talking on something they don't know anything about, but they're, they're moving God's word. Isn't that fabulous? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for seeing in us, as your children, a mission for each one that we can carry out. Help us, Lord, to trust you and be asking you where we can serve. Help us not to hesitate, for time is short. May we find, be found working in the vineyard when you come, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>